This video will carry on our results for the minimum determinant energy of a set of Hartree-Fox spin orbitals into a more convenient form, which we will ultimately call the canonical Hartree-Fox equations. So if we have some set of spin orbitals initially, chi a, and then we apply some transformation to them, we can end up with what we call a set of transformed orbitals, or chi a prime. So we would, might do this by taking some initial chi b, the set of all the initial orbitals, and then applying some linear combination to them. So multiply by some coefficient and add up to get what the new transformed orbitals are. And we can do this because it's assumed that whatever spin orbitals we have, that the set of those spin orbitals are what we would call complete. That is, we can represent any three-dimensional function as a linear combination of those spin orbitals. So that means that any set of spin orbitals can be expressed as a linear combination of our initial set of spin orbitals. And on and on it goes as, as much as we would like to continue transforming them. So what we're going to show below is basically that the choice of spin orbital sets is completely arbitrary and that none of our physical properties of our system actually depend on which spin orbital set we have. So in that sense, spin orbitals really aren't real, but they're just a convenient abstraction to help us get at some of these uh, physical properties in simulation. So if all sets of spin orbitals are equally arbitrary or equally good, equally bad, then why don't we just choose a mathematically convenient set of spin orbitals, and that would be the orthonormal set. So the set where <clears throat> the overlap integral between any two spin orbitals is a Kronecker delta, meaning it's normalized, or one, if the two are the same, and it is orthogonal, or zero, if the two are different. So in such a, in such a circumstance, that would be the set of canonical Hartree-Fock orbitals, which we are trying to get by solving the canonical Hartree-Fock equations, which we're going to try to arrive at in this video. Okay, so what do we know about this particular transformation matrix here? So we're going to show below that the type of matrix that we need to have here is going to be a matrix which ends up being what we would call unitary. So a unitary matrix is defined as a matrix whose Hermitian adjoint is equal to its inverse. So we'll remind ourselves that the Hermitian adjoint of a matrix is you take the transpose, that is UAB becomes UBA, and then you take the complex conjugate. You take the, the complex conjugate of whatever elements result from the transpose. And of course, the inverse is the matrix that you multiply a matrix by to get an identity matrix left over an identity matrix just being one where you have ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. So this means that for a uh, Hermitian matrix, or for a unitary matrix, we have uh, the matrix times its Hermitian adjoint, or vice versa, is going to end up with an identity matrix. Okay, so if we define some matrix A, where all of the rows of the matrix represent particular electrons and all of the columns of the matrix represent particular spin orbitals, then the determinant of this matrix is our ground state Hartree-Fock wave function, or shall I say the normalized determinant of this matrix, because in that matrix, that determinant's going to have uh, n factorial permutations of these rows and column products, so we have to have a 1 over square root of n factorial normalization constant. So our wave function is n factorial to the negative 1 half of the determinant of this matrix. And so if we want to look at what our transformed orbitals are, basically our transformed orbital matrix is going to be the initial orbital matrix times some unitary matrix. So. Uh, the determinant of a, mat of a matrix, the determinant of a product of two matrices is going to be the product of those determinants. So determinant of A prime is going to be the determinant of U times the determinant of A. Uh, likewise, for an identity matrix, its determinant is 1 because down the diagonals, you multiply all those 1s together, you get 1, and every other permutation is going to be 0. So an identity matrix gives you a determinant of 1, 
And of course, a unitary matrix times its adjoint is an identity matrix, so that's also the same. And the determinant of a product is the product of the determinants, so determinant of u dagger times determinant of u. Additionally, the determinant of an adjoint is going to be the complex conjugate of the determinant because if we take the transpose, the, the determinant of a transpose is the same, and then taking the complex conjugate just takes a complex conjugate of the result. So that means that this is now the determinant of the complex conjugate of the determinant times itself. And the complex conjugate of a number times itself is just the magnitude of that number squared, or the magnitude square. So this means whatever matrix we're using to do the transformation, if we don't want to mess up the normalization and we want to keep everything normalized to wherever it was, then we better use a unitary matrix, which is any matrix whose determinant is going to be some, uh, some, some complex number uh, which can re be represented as e to the i phi, a number whose complex magnitude is equal to 1. And in that case, what this is going to end up meaning is that the energy, and in fact not only the energy but all other physical properties, are going to be invariant to whichever set of orbitals we use. So the trans transforming the set of orbitals doesn't change the energy, it doesn't change any other property, uh, because all of those, uh, an aggregate as a set, uh, end up being the same energy, as long as they are related by some unitary transformation. So we can see this in effect for the Coulomb operator. So uh, if it's true for the Coulomb operator, then it's going to be the same arguments going to apply to the exchange operator. And if it applies to both of them, then it's going to apply to the mean field potential. And that mean field potential is how the electron in a spin orbital interacts with all of the other spin orbitals. So if we take the Coulomb operator for all orbitals interacting with our, our particular orbital in question, that's going to be sum over a for a equals 1 to n, integral over electron 2 of chi a prime star chi a prime, which is the charge density of an electron in orbital chi a prime, times the 1 over r12 uh, coulomb, 1 over r12 operator. And we'll note that these transformed orbitals, as we mentioned, are the original orbitals uh, times some unitary uh, coefficients in a linear combination. So we get sum over b, u a b star, chi b star, sum over c, u a c, chi c. So keeping the indices b and c separate so as to not confuse what comes from where. And now we have a sum over a, b, and c, each of them from uh, 1 to n. So we can actually factor these three sums in any way we'd like. So why don't we do the following factorization? Let's uh, sum out the b and c sums. And inside, let's factor out the sum over a as the uab star, which we'll note that due to the fact that these matrices are Hermitian, that the unitary matrix uab star the element UAB star is going to be uh, UBA of the of the adjoint. So we get UAB adjoint times UAC. And multiplying those particular rows, uh, if we if we zip those two together, um, this is actually going to end up being a an identity matrix once we once we zip over those, and its and its elements are going to be identity matrix elements. So this term inside of parentheses here is going to be 1 if b and c are equal, and it's going to be 0 if b and c are not equal. So that means only one of these terms in the sum over c is going to be non-zero, and that term is going to be 1. So we're in fact getting rid of that sum over c, and we got rid of the sum over a by doing this uh, unitary or this identity matrix transformation. So it's only the sum over b that's left. And the only thing that's left inside the sum is this uh, integral that we've been tagging along with. So now we have the, the chi star b uh, chi c. But remember, this was only non-zero when b equals c. So the c is now a b. So now we have just a sum over b integral over electron 2 chi b star chi b, 
which is in fact just the Coulomb operator for all orbitals uh, b equals 1 to n, which is the same as it was for all orbitals uh, a prime equals 1 to n. So in fact, we've shown here that the net effect of the electron interacting with all other electrons for its Coulomb uh, repulsion is going to be invariant to the choice of orbitals. And the same logic and math would apply to the, to the exchange operators as well if you carried that through. So that shows that the uh, Coulomb and exchange operators are invariant to the choice of orbitals. And we could do a similar analysis for the one electron integrals and in fact get the fact that our entire Fock operator is actually invariant to the choice of orbitals as well. All right, so if we take our Fock operator and we take the expression we had from the end of the previous video, where we have F acting on uh, chi A equals sum over B of epsilon uh, B A times chi B. And we're, gonna, we're going to multiply on the left-hand side of both sides by orbital uh, chi C star, and then integrate to get these kind of Dirac in integrals for both cases. So the sum on the right-hand side here is basically the overlap of orbitals B and C times their Lagrange multiplier. But in fact, over all of the orbitals, um, if the orbitals are complete, these coefficients uh, have to end, end up being equal to epsilon CA in order for this expression to make sense or for our orbitals to be, or for our orbitals to be normalized in any way. So this is epsilon CA. So in fact, when we, when we look at uh, what these elements have to be for any uh, particular pair of orbitals, if we look at a particular transformed set of orbitals, if we look at epsilon AB prime, so this is then going to be some integral over. So as we've shown here that this uh, epsilon CA is going to be this particular matrix element here. Epsilon uh, AB prime is going to be the integral over all coordinates for electron 1, chi A star um, times the Fock operator acting on chi B. And then if we look at what those transformed orbitals were in order for this to be the case, in order for this, uh, for this sum to work out nicely here and just be kind of a single term, that's going to be we substitute in the unitary transformation for um, chi A, uh, U star C A, chi star C, and the transformation for chi B prime, which is going to be our U D B uh, times chi D. And then that's going to be a sum over C and a sum over D to do those two uh, transformations of each of the orbitals. And in fact, once we factor everything out, as I've conveniently written in this type of way here, we get a sum over C and D of um, this U star C A is equal to U dagger A C. Um, flip the indices and take the complex conjugate, and then you get the adjoint. Of, and then epsilon C D is the result that's on the inside here for this matrix element. And then we have U D B on the inside there um, for what, when we transformed uh, the orbital uh, chi B, chi B prime. And this expression is equivalent to saying that uh, when we choose an arbitrary A and an arbitrary B, that our epsilon prime, that that is equal to uh, the adjoint of our unitary matrix, U dagger, times the original epsilon Lagrange multiplier matrix, uh, epsilon, times our unitary matrix, U. So uh, we showed here that we're trying to get to a set of transformed orbitals which is going to be uh, orthonormal to one another. And in the case where those orbitals are going to be orthonormal to one another, uh, then this is actually going to end up being a diagonal matrix. So in effect, we're looking for the unitary matrix, which is going to end up diagonalizing uh, this matrix of Lagrange multipliers that we had from the previous video. And in fact, we can always do this because as we mentioned in the previous video, this matrix of Lagrange multipliers is Hermitian and you can always find a unitary matrix which will diagonalize a given uh, Hermitian matrix. So in fact, whenever we choose our epsilon AB such that we have a uh, diagonal matrix as a result, then we can always express our Fock operator 
in this kind of canonical form, where the Fock operator acting on the orbital chi A prime is equal to the orbital energy E A prime times the same orbital chi A prime. So in fact, what this has shown in the, in the past two videos, um, rather obtusely, but we ended up getting there, um, is the fact that the minimum energy determinant, or the minimum energy Hartree-Fock um, set of orbitals, is the orbital set such that uh, we, have an, we have an eigenvalue equation uh, between the Fock operator and the particular uh, sets of orbitals. That is, for any individual orbital which is occupied, the Fock operator, or for any individual orbital, spin orbital of the molecule, uh, the Fock operator acting on that spin orbital is going to give back the orbital energy times that same spin orbital. So whenever we have a situation where this is true for all spin orbitals, that's where we have the determinant, which is the minimum energy, and it's in fact going to be solving to get to this set of equations uh, where we're going to do the rest of our work in this chapter on Hartree-Fock theory in terms of how do we get to um, the situation where our orbitals are in fact all eigenfunctions of the Fock operator.